thinking. Um, so we did the effects of hole placement and width on frequency in an open air column. And what an open air column basically is, is a tube which is open at both ends. Um, you can see right there. Um, and that shows how the sound waves travel through the tube. And it's described by the equation um, frequency equals the velocity divided by two times the length. Um, when we began this ex experiment, we hoped to test the effects of temperature and humidity um, since they affect the speed of sound. Um, but through further research and um, when doing calculations, um, we determined that um, we did not have um, instruments um, precise enough to calculate um, the changes. So we decided to modify our experiment. So what we decided to do instead was to put um, holes and tubes like these and see what effects that would have on frequency. Um, and we were expecting two different results. By putting holes at the end of the tubes, we were hoping to see if that could um, increase frequency by, decrease, er, by decreasing the length of the tube, increase the frequency. And um, we were also hoping to eliminate certain harmonics. Now how you would do this is if you would First look at this sound wave. This is the first harmonic sound wave. And you have the node in the middle. The node is where the air is actually not moving. So the anti-node at the ends, where the tube is open to the atmosphere, is where the air is moving the most. Now if you put a hole in the middle of the tube, you get an anti-node in the middle of the tube. And so you create a much different wave. Um, and this is the second harmonic. So by putting a hole in the middle of the tube, you can eliminate the odd harmonic. Um, we were inspired to do this experiment um, because we both play the flute, and the flute is a complex open air column. So based on our research um, and what we knew about the flute, um, we developed a hypothesis which said um, that the frequency of an open air column decreases with increasing length. Holes in the open air columns will shorten the length of the air column and holes in the air column will eliminate specific harmonics. So we started by determining the control, and we took um, three different size tubes, and um, what we did was we um, produced sound by tapping it with a pencil on the end. And I don't, it was, it's a very um, soft sound, but, and it's kind of an unusual t way to make a sound, but we found that doing this with a microphone at the end of the tube was the best way to um, produce a consistent sound. And um, we used the computer program Adobe Edition 1.5 um, to analyze the frequency of the taps. Um, then for our first experiment, um, we used um, the short tube. And what we did was drilled a hole um, very close to the end of the tube and tapped this end and um, recorded the sound and analyzed the frequency. Um, we did this for um, second, third, and fourth holes. And also, after each hole was added, we did a second test where we covered the hole to make sure um, that the change in frequency was an effect of um, by limiting the hole rather than just changing the material. We moved on to the medium-sized tube, and what we did here was um, we put two holes in this tube, about um, two-thirds of the way down the tube, which is the same length as the short tube. So we have, you probably can't see it from there, but we have a hole, holes right here. And um, so after each hole was drilled, we um, tapped and took the frequency and after each hole, we also flipped around the tube and tapped on the other side to see what effect that would have. Um, and long tube. Um, first, with the long tube, what we did, um, we added a hole exactly in the middle of the tube. And then um, that was to test the placement of holes. And then we did a second test with the long tube. And um, what we did, we added a hole in the middle that was twice the diameter of the previous holes and um, recorded the sound and analyzed the frequency.
So the first thing that we discovered um, about our controls was that our measured frequencies were consistently um, about 20 hertz lower than our expected frequencies that we had calculated using that original equation, um, frequency equals the velocity divided by two times the length. And we did some more research because we were concerned about this discrepancy. And what we discovered was that there's something called end corrections. And what this does is you have to add, um, you have to add end corrections onto the length of the tube. And so, because the um, frequency of the tube is, um, it's as if the tube is actually longer than it is. And this can be explained because the air in the tube is moving when the sound wave is moving through the tube, but the air outside the tube is not um, moving, and this air still has mass and inertia. So the air inside of the tube still ha has to work harder, so to speak, to get that air outside the tube moving. And so it pushes a little beyond the ends of the tube. So when we were using the other equation, we were assuming that the nodes, the anti-nodes were right at the end of the tube, wh whereas they're a little extended. So we used the equation um, 0.58 times the radius of the tube, and that's the end corrections that you have to end add onto, onto the tube for each end. Um, and this was based on the radius because um, how much air has to be pushed depends on the width of the tube. And so we recalculated the frequency using this formula, which is the same thing, but with the end corrections. So after doing this, when we compared um, our new numbers, um, taking the end corrections into consideration, we found that there is very little difference between the new measured and the expected results. Um, the greatest difference was 1.5% error. So um, then for the short tube, um, first we found that um, there was also a slight discrepancy between um, the expected and measured, and we describe that by the fact that um, when the anti-node, it doesn't form exactly at the end of the hole, it's slightly past, um, and then also. Yeah, it's, the, it's the same effect as the end corrections, but with the holes in the tube. Um, and so now for these graphs, they're a little unusual. We made them by taking all the frequencies and then dividing them by the fundamental frequency for the short tube. And so what you see here is the harmonics. Those whole numbers on the bottom, the one, two, and three, if you just look at the top graph, those are the harmonics. So you can see in our control, we had um, occurrences of the first, second, and third harmonics. And now if you look at the second and third holes with the, um, with the holes effectively shortening the tube, you get an increase in frequency. And so you can see the frequency shifting from the first and second and third har harmonics. They're shifting up. And you see this shift even more with the, third, with the three holes. Um, so then for the medium tube, um, we had several factors. Um, first of all, um, because we did um, test by tapping at both ends, by reversing, um, from that we found that it didn't matter um, which end we tapped on. And this is explained by the fact that in an open air column, if you recall the picture, um, the wave travels in both directions. So it doesn't actually matter what end you tap. Now, um, for the medium tube, we also want, do you want to talk about the third harmonic? Yeah. OK. Um, we had another factor, um, which was um, if you look at the picture up there, you can see that um, for each of the harmonics, um, it's shifted over when you add the holes. But um, for the third harmonic, um, it stays um, almost exactly the same. And um, this is if you, this is the picture um, with of the tube with no hole. But then um, this is by adding a hole a third of the length on the tube, which is what we did and it creates the third harmonic. So that's why um, the third harmonic remained the same um, when the holes were added. OK. The third um, thing we noticed about the middle tube was that although um, the short tube, the holes we made um, in the middle tube corresponded to the short tube, the frequency from the 
medium tube was much lower. And this was um, due to the cross fingering effect, which is actually used in the flute. Um, what happens is even if you have a hole open um, up here, if you have holes closed further down, that lowers the pitch. And this is again because the wave extends beyond the hole. And um, with the holes closed further down, the air can't escape, so to speak. Um, and in the flute, you can, if you know the fingerings, you can see that oftentimes there are open holes while there are holes closed further down. And this is to um, change the pitches. Then for the long tube, um, for the control, which is the first graph, um, saw the presence of seven different harmonics. Um, but then when we added the first hole, which was um, exactly in the middle of the tube, um, the lower um, odd harmonics were eliminated which is what we expected to happen. Um, but then, um, when we added the wide hole, um, we saw a strange effect. Um, there's still the presence of the um, even harmonics. is the same with um, the narrower um, hole. But there are um, other harmonics as well. And we're not exactly sure where that is, but um, we have several theories. So our first theory, I don't know if you get, it's difficult to see on this graph. Um, but what we're talking about is we are expecting the second, fourth, sixth, eighth, tenth, and twelfth harmonics because we were trying to eliminate the odd harmonics. But we also got these lines here, which aren't really any harmonics. Um, and so that's what we're trying to explain. We have some theories, as Julie said. Our first theory is um, we came up with after listening to what the tube sounded like. And I'm going to try to hit this. Um, I don't know if you. Do you want to <laughs> hold it? Yeah. Just hold it and yeah. yeah. So this is um, much louder. We usually tap it with a pencil, but that's just to give you an idea. Um, and if you listen carefully, I know it's difficult to hear, but if you listen carefully, you can kind of hear a lower pitch and then a higher pitch. Now with our really wide hole, um, we thought that maybe the sound was coming out of this hole because it was so big, in addition to the end of the tube. And um, so what we did was we calculated the frequencies for what um, it would be if it was coming out of this hole. Now, the problem is that they didn't <coughs> correspond to the frequencies that we were getting on this third graph. So we came up with a second theory. Um, because if you look at these lines again, you can see that they're gradually approaching the odd harmonic. And finally, by the 11th harmonic, they've reached it. And this is the same pattern that we saw up here, that the lower harmonics, um, odd harmonics, were eliminated. But as you got higher, um, they approached closer to the odd harmonic. And so we think that for some reason, by putting the wider hole in, we um, got the odd harmonics back, but they're severely shifted. And then as we got higher, they got closer. So we had um, several conclusions. Um, first, that the frequency did um, decrease with longer lengths, but the um, end corrections must also be considered. Um, and we also noticed that holes in the air column increased the frequency, but not as much as expected because, again, the um, sound waves go beyond the holes. Um, and then, again, uh, the cross fingering effect holes that are not at the end of the tube do not have the same effect as holes that are, are at the end of the tube um, because holes that are closed further down lower the pitch. And last, the last one is um, the holes in the middle of the tube eliminate certain harmonics, but not all of them. And then we have that last hole, which is wider, that comes with, um, up with stranger harmonics that we haven't explained yet. Um, so if we were to continue this project, um, although we did do um, 16 replicates for each hole, um, we could do those on various lengths of tube um, to see if there is a difference in effect, although our results were very consistent. So we don't think that that would change um, results very much. Um, also, we would do um, more experiments with cross-fingering um, by adding um, more holes. And um, then we would try to determine um, why the wider hole um, we had um, twice the amount of harmonics um, for our test with a long tube.
And then these are our acknowledgements. So I don't know. Are, are uh, we taking questions now, or are you? A couple of questions after each talk, and then we'll okay. open it up later on after our presentation. Okay. No. No, but most of them are. There's some um, holes that are smaller. They're trill keys or different functions. Any other? Yes. Uh, a pipe organ is a prime example of this type of uh, mm -hmm. pipes. <laughs> Correct? Oh, yeah. I'm not really sure oh. how pipe organ works, but well, if. <laughs> a series of tubes. Uh -huh. holes okay. And with uh, air under pressure. Okay. Yeah, um, well, what we did, we, I think we did about like 20 or 30 different taps, and then we, um, we looked at them using MATLAB, uh, not MATLAB, sorry, Adobe, Adobe. Adobe. and um, we chose ones <laughs> that were, um, that generally, um, for like the trend of, like so the most consistent, because um, sometimes they, we would accidentally like bang the microphone, so there would be like, um, uh, the, the frequency wouldn't be very clear. But um, so the ones that we chose um, just yeah, were we basically the average of. We only chose four out of those 20, mm -hmm. so we tried to pick the best ones. And the we found that pencil tapping was the best way. It's a little strange, but we tried everything else, like just banging or metronomes and clocks, and nothing else worked. So. Well, all the speakers will be available after <coughs> Okay. Our next speaker this afternoon is Jesse Alden. She's a junior at Brown Academy. And she won first place award at Thanks. Brown Academy. And she's first award okay. for the Fair. I'm starting with a little bit of a cold. I am so I think my birthday is out of funny. <laughs> Really close to my face. That's okay. Good. Okay. Uh, all right. Thank you. Um, as she said, my name is Jesse Alden. Um, I'm a junior at Falmouth Academy. Um, you're going to have to excuse my voice. I'm struggling with a little bit of a cold. Um, so my project is titled The Algae Alternative, um, an investigation of the uses for excess Clodophora vagabunda in Waquite Bay. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar. Um, Waquite Bay um, is actually just up the street a little bit. Um, the part where I was working um, collecting algae is in Mashpee. Some of it's also in Falmouth. Um, this is an aerial view of Waquite Bay. Um, it's a shallow bay. There are a lot of marine life, shellfish beds. Um, it's in a quite heavily populated um, area of Cape Cod. As you can see from this aerial photo, you can see all of the development around the bay. And this is a little bit of an older picture. Um, so it's been further populated since. Um, what you may not know about Ukwite Bay is there are a few problems existing in the bay. Um, this, this algae, Clodophora vagabunda, is, um, has over the past few years and over the past decades, really, um, has started to take over the bay. Uh, it's a very fast growing algae when uh, given the right nutrients. Um, most of the time the limiting nutrient on growth of algae like this is nitrogen and uh, it, that's what's theorized to have spurred the quick growth and rapid growth of this algae in the bay. Um, you would think that algae being a natural substance, um, it's in all sorts of um, water, places, um, oceans, ponds, streams, everywhere, 
um, that it wouldn't be causing such a problem. Um, but this algae is multiplied so much that it's starting to harm the other marine life, um, the shellfish beds, and um, all sorts of other things in the, um, in the bay, such as mussels, clams. Um, and the way it does that is um, the algae forms in mats. Um, and because it's so tightly knit together, it blocks a lot of the light for photosynthesis. Um, and so a lot of the other algae that's in the bay is um, the oxygen supply and, uh, excuse me, not the oxygen supply, the light supply, which is needed for their photosynthesis, um, is, is taken up by this algae. And also, um, because the algae is forming in mats, um, it's, it sort of clumps around um, shellfish um, and um, hinders the process um, the sh that the, when shellfish um, gather nutrients from the water, they suck in water um, and the algae gets clogged in them a lot of times um, because the algae w rests at the bottom of the, av of the shallow bays and on the um, shallow places in the middle of the bay. Um, and also, um, decomposition of this algae um, requires oxygen, and oxygen is also needed um, by the other marine life, the fish, the shellfish in the bay. So the excess use of oxygen by the Clodophora um, uses up a lot of the oxygen that these plants and animals require. Um, so this is um, the summer of 2003 um, in Wakwait Bay. This is not um, a sandbar in the middle of the bay. This is an alg algal bloom. Um, this summer uh, of 2003, there was an excess of this algae. Um, it got a bit out of control, and a lot of the mats dislodged and um, came off, off the bottom of the bay. Um, and as you can see, um, in the harbor, the boats are um, kind of covered up by the algae. The, they couldn't swim. It was all up on the beach. Um, this is another picture of it. As you can see, it's all the way up on the beach, and these mats, um, they're really thick. They can be up to, in, um, the, I think in this bloom, they measured you know, at least three meters um, thick in some places. And um, this stretched miles along the beach. You can see sort of up at the top of the picture, as the uh, water goes around the corner, um, the different color um, from the contrast between the algae and the sand. Um, so um, as I said, Clodophora vagabunda, um, it's a grass green algae. Um, it forms in tufts and form, um, forms in likes to live in shallow bays um, where it can get light from um, the water, um, through the water, excuse me. Um, and it tends to form in mats. So my purpose um, was to try and find some way to um, be able to fund, economic economically fund the removal of the algae from the bay to try and relieve the pressure um, in the bay. And um, my first thought um, was based on an article I read in the Boston Globe. Um, there's a project going on up at MIT where scientists are using a different sort of algae and they are using the, um, the things that come out of the MIT power plant um, and combining the pollutants, which is mostly CO2. They're using the carbon that comes out of the CO2 to combine with a different sort of algae. And as it combines and photosynthesizes it and dries, it forms sort of a flaky carbon-like substance. And you can in turn burn that like coal. It looks a lot like coal um, once it's finished reacting. Um, and they have these big, this, they're where they're doing this experiment, they have these big triangular tubes um, they come down, they're, they're like eight feet tall and they're really wide and they have, they're clear plastic so the algae is allowed to photosynthesize. Um, there's water inside the tube and um, they sort of bubble the gases from the, the plant up through these tubes and uh, then also use the heat from the power plant to help dry the algae. Um, so although when you burn it, it still produces carbon dioxide, um, you're getting energy um, but you're in sort of a CO2 equili equilibrium, so to speak, because you're using the CO2 to produce this, this thing and putting the same CO2 that's already being released into the, at into the atmosphere back out into the atmosphere um, and getting energy in the process with no extra CO2. 
Um, so that was where I forgot the first part of um, the experiment from. I wanted to see if I could burn this algae um, as and try to use it as a fuel. Um, and that sort of led me down a path um, towards insulation, which I will explain to you a little bit later. Um, to find how much energy um, something can produce, um, you can use um, the equation Q equals mc delta t, um, which if you are familiar with chemistry, um, the Q is the heat of the reaction and m is the mass of the substance and C is the specific heat and delta T is the change in temperature. Um, now the way you measure this is with a calorimeter. Um, this is the calorimeter I made. It's just a tin can with some fiberglass insulation around it and some tin foil to help um, hold the heat in so that you don't lose any heat. Um, and inside um, there's water and the way you measure it is you know the mass of the water inside the calorimeter and as you can see, there's a ring sand here. Um, the substance being burned, um, which is what I did with the algae, and I did it with ethyl alcohol and home heating oil. Um, the substance goes underneath here, and the amount of, um, the, the number of degrees that the water inside the calorimeter goes up is, is the delta T. And what you're actually doing is um, calculating the heat gained by the water. Um, because you're assuming that you're not losing any energy in the process, so the heat of the reaction is going to equal the heat of the products. Um, and of course, as you can see with the system, you do lose some heat, because if you're burning something underneath here, some heat is going to escape down the bottom, some up around um, the calorimeter, and you also might lose some heat because it's not covered. Um, but in, this, in the way that I did this, um, all of the substances were burned at the same distance away from the calorimeter, so you're losing approximately the same percent of heat. And what I was really trying to do is get a comparison between substances that are known to produce um, good amounts of energy, um, such as home heating oil and ethyl alcohol and this algae. Um, after I burned this and um, burned the algae and burned the ethyl alcohol and home heating oil, those both were done in alcohol burners underneath the calorimeter, um, I found um, through calculations um, that the Clodophora vagabunda produced um, 3.6 kilojoules of energy per gram um, compared to home heating oils 15.0 and ethyl alcohols 12.5 grams. Um, kilojoules per gram, excuse me. Um, and as you can see, um, the home heating oil, which is something that's really commonly used for, um, to burn for energy, is um, almost three times as much as the algae. Um, and for the amount of energy that you're having to put into the algae by harvesting it, um, it might not be cost effective um, when you're factoring in how much time and energy it's going to take to, to harvest and dry um, the algae because it has to be completely dry um, before you can burn it. Um, and another problem um, with the algae burning is um, that it was very resistant to flame unless it was completely um, dry and even then um, I had to use a piece of newspaper to get it started. Um, Hopefully, the calculations um, are without the effect of the newspaper because I calculated how much each piece of I um, calculated how much the newspaper um, how much heat the re newspaper release per gram before uh, doing that and then being and then subtracting the total energy produced um, subtracting the energy of the newspaper from the total. Um, so that shouldn't have made an effect on the calculations, but. It, uh, you do have to factor it in if you're trying to try and use it as some sort of cost-effective way to produce energy. Um, so the properties of, of this algae, which include the resistance to flame, um, are what inspired me to move along. Um, this is just a graph of this before I um, move along. Um, as you can see, um, how much lower the algae is from um, the heating oil and the alcohol. Um, it's quite a big difference. Um, and although the algae didn't produce as much energy as hoped, um, it could, the, uh, there's a possibility of um, if you could combine it with uh, 
um, wood chips that are being already being sent up to um, the northern New England um, and being burned wet um, and it's working because they're burning it at such high temperatures. Um, if you're just trying to use it as a way to get the algae out of the bay, um, you can combine it with these, um, the wood chips, and that would also encourage its burning. Um, but as far as the energy purposes of it, you're not going to get a whole lot of energy from it. Um, so because of the properties and um, because it also has a very low density and is flame retardant and has, um, you can take a look at the algae, I have some over there after the presentation, but um, it's very sort of, um, it's light and there's a lot of um, air pockets in between. Um, and so that, those are qualities that are needed in a, in an, in a home insulation because the way um, insulation works is tra it traps heat inside the air pockets of the substance. Um, so R value is the measure of heat, um, and it's a measure to the resistance of heat, um, and it's directly proportional to the thickness of the substance that's blocking the heat. Uh, the way you calculate R value is um, the delta T, which is um, if there's a heat source inside of an apparatus or inside of a home um, and there's a temperature inside of it and outside and just outside of it, um, the difference between those two thermometers, once um, the uh, temperature stops going up inside the box, once it reaches an equilibrium, that's, the de that's the d what the delta T value is. And it, that's times the, cons con times the constant, which is a factor of the wattage and the heat produced by whatever is inside the apparatus and, um, and the area of the apparatus. So for this experiment, um, I was able to eliminate the BTU and area factors because I was using the same apparatus for each of the calculations and could calculate the constant rather than solving um, using the constant. Um, um, I constructed, you can see the box um, of plywood sitting right over there on the table, and um, there, um, there are temperature probes outside the box and through a hole so that it's on the inside of the box, and um, there's a 15 watt light bulb in there, and um, I did the temperature um, equilibrium calculations for each of two inches of algae in cheesecloth bats, two inches of fiberglass, and two inches of polyurethane foam. Um, and the polyurethane foam and fiberglass are well-known insulators and um, come right on the package with an R value, and that's where you can calculate the constant to solve for the algae, um, the algae's um, constant value. And so um, this is what the box looks like inside. Um, you can see the light bulb and the foam. Now the important thing with the box is that the substance needs to be flush against the side of it or you're not going to get a correct temperature reading because um, heat will be um, lost in um, spaces between the box and the insulating substance. So it's extremely important to have no air pockets. Um, and as you can see, the algae is pushed up against the side. Um, those, those are just, just cheesecloth so that um, the algae is really doing the insulating rather than um, something binding it. And so um, to calculate R value, um, I already explained this a little bit, but um, you can see over here, um, the empty box um, is also, it's part of a system. The, so the plywood has an R value uh, and um, the total R value of something um, is, is the R value rather than just the R value of the substance. So you have to subtract the, um, the plywood value. And um, you can see up at the top um, the three known substances, um, their known R values, and knowing their delta T values, um, a calculation of the constant. And then that average of a constant is what's used to produce the um, R value va for the algae. Um, and the R value of the algae was found to be five, um, 
5.9 on an R value scale. Um, an R value scale is just a method of comparison. There aren't any units. Um, it's just a way to compare insulations. And um, the higher the R value, the better insulation, the more resistance to heat it has. So the two inches of fiberglass, a known R value is 8, and um, polyurethane foam is 12.8. And this is just a graph of those comparisons. Um, you can see the algae is not that much lower than the fiberglass. Um, and um, that's encouraging because um, you can see how much difference fiberglass has between um, it and polyurethane foam, and both are used for very common insulators. So a difference of approximately two between an algae and a fiberglass isn't that much of a difference on an R value scale. Um, and although the algae doesn't re resist this heat as well as the other two substances, um, it can still be um, encouraged as a as a possible um, insulator. And the R value can also be increased by the thickness of the algae bats because R value is uh, um, related directly to the thickness. Um, before I get to possible future research, um, um, the algae, um, because it's a naturally occurring substance, um, Fiberglass is um, pretty expensive to, to produce, and um, fiberglass, um, because it's not naturally occurring, it's man-made, um, and if you can use this, the funds um, in, in sort of a fun comparison, if you use that same money to harvest the algae, um, you could use, because it's naturally occurring, you could use more of it to increase the R value, um, and rather than spending a lot of money on producing it. Um, possible future research for um, other uses for this algae um, is used as, as, as mulch because it's a nitrogen absorbing substance. Um, you can use the nitrogen to fertilize things and mix it with compost. Um, and because it's a saltwater plant, it won't be sprouting in your garden with fresh water um, as many other natural um, fertilizers would. Um, so, in conclusion, um, the Cladophora was found to have potential um, in both places, but the uh, potential in the insulation part of the experiment were much more encouraging than the um, potential in the energy portion. Um, and the al algae, but the algae definitely performed well enough to encourage further research in both areas um, because it's so necessary to get this stuff out of the bay before it gets completely out of control. Um, and you, I mean, you may wonder, you know, who cares? It's um, it's sort of a just a little local bay. But if something um, if something isn't done soon, um, Wakoi Bay may com be completely taken over. All the shellfish beds may um, be extinct, and um, it may be completely out of control. Um, and also, alternative energy sources um, are being researched um, quite a lot recently because we're moving towards a um, point of fossil fuel extinction. And um, if, t if um, these two energy, I mean, these two environmental issues could be, um, you know, combined and solved with one, one technology, it would be um, very a big advantage. Um, and so um, I would just like to thank a couple of people, um, Mr. Richard Gregory Allen and um, Richard York for um, their interest. Both of them are scientists, um, and um, Mr. York is a, um, works closely with Waquite Bay. And my chemistry teacher, um, Dr. Johnson, and also my dad um, for the power, power tool um, necessity, and um, MBL and Hui for their donations. So thank you. Yes, in the back. Um, I use the algae dead because um, if it's um, alive, it's still going to be wet and it's not going to burn without being completely dry. Yes, but that's it's actually kind of interesting. Um, this algae, I can show you um, one of the bats. Um, it doesn't smell that bad. Um, a lot of algae sort of turn to slime. <laughs>
and, um, and get kind of smelly and gross and they decompose. But this stuff is actually pretty cool. Um, it's sort of sponge-like um, and it, um, it doesn't really decompose. This has been sitting in a closed box since our science fair in February and hasn't decomposed at all. Um, so it's pretty cool and it doesn't smell that bad. It would double. It's um, directly proportional. And then, how many replicates would you need Well, because it takes so long to um, get the equilibrium up um, when you have the insulation in the box, um, I did two replications for each of the control substances and the algae and the um, plywood box and took a, um, an average of the constant to solve for the value. Yeah. with a couple of scientists at the Oceanographic My project is called Chemotaxis in E. coli. Now, first of all, E. coli, which is a type of bacterium, move. They ro use many rotating flagella, or helical filaments, which are basically a string of proteins in a 3D spiral. And to move, they spin these flagella counterclockwise to r go forwards or run and clockwise to have them splay out in all directions instead of a bundle at the back and make it tumble to face in a new, in a new direction. So if you have an E. coli bacterium swimming along in the tube, it's right now rotating its flagella counterclockwise and therefore running. But if it tumbles, it's rotating its flagella clockwise, causing them to splay out in all directions for about a tenth of a second and making it point in a new direction, at which point it then starts running again. Now, E. coli will also respond to nutrients in their movement. If you have a gradient of a chemical that E. coli like, such as some kind of food, then their run times will be longer if they're moving up the gradient. And if they're moving down the gradient, their run times will be far shorter than normal. And conversely, if they're moving up a gradient of some undesirable chemical, such as an extreme pH change or possibly some toxin, then their run times will be much shorter than usual. And if they're moving down such a gradient, their run times will be much longer. Now, supposing that at this end you have a high level of nutrients at the green end, and at the black end over here, you have a low level of nutrients. And you have an E. coli bacterium swimming along in the upward nutrient direction. Now, since it's going up the gradient, its, its run time is longer than it normally would be. But at this point, it decides to tumble. And so it heads backwards down the gradient, causing its run time to shorten drastically. It's already stopped. And so it tumbles much sooner causing it to head back up the gradient. This process of running and tumbling because of nutrients or chemicals is called chemotaxis. And chemotaxis means moving because of chemicals. Now, I wanted to test how chemotaxis will affect a whole population of E. coli instead of just a single bacterium. And I hypothesized that if you have a growth medium that has a constant, very high level of nutrients throughout a very thin tube, then the E. coli would diffuse out in a path like this on a graph, which would eventually grow f flatter and flatter until it was just a straight line across the graph. 
Now to test this, I had a set up with a microscope right here. And up here, there was a video camera, which fed a live video to a computer back here, which was running a tracking program developed by Dr. Scott Gallagher and his team. And this processed the data and extracted various, this, well, this processed the video and extracted various data points from it. And over here, we have a hair dryer hooked up to a variac, which controls the current going to the hair dryer so that I could control the temperature on the stage. Zooming in on the stage, there's a temperature probe here so that I could tell what temperature the stage was and adjust accordingly. And right here, there is a very thin glass tube called a capillary tube. And the capillary tube that I was using is 0.3 millimeters thick, 3 millimeters wide, and 100 millimeters long. And it's pretty fragile. And in my experimental tube, I, down at the, in the first 10 millimeters of the tube, I had a mixture of Luria broth and E. coli. The Luria broth is a liquid that is full of nutrients that E. coli like. They'll grow well under, the con under conditions like that. And the rest of the tube was just filled with Luria broth, no bacteria. And in the control tube, there was Luria broth where the E. coli started. But in the rest of the tube, there was just a substance called Davis minimal broth. And it just will keep the E. coli alive, but they won't be happy in it. They won't grow very, very well. Now, along the tube, I had several monitoring stations from 1 to 10, starting at the point where the E. coli had, starting at the interface between the E. coli and the clear liquid through uh, where they, they started. And each station was 10 millimeters apart down the tube. And I would, to take the data for that station at a certain time, I would position the tube on the microscope so that it was looking at that station. And then I would record 30 seconds of video. And every two minutes, I would shift position down the tube. And so a full sweep of the tube would take 20 minutes. During each 30 seconds of video that I recorded, I'd record several data points. I'd record the time the video was taken at. I'd also record the station number. I'd record the number of tracks, or how many E. coli were seen. I'd record the mean speed of those tracks to see how fast they were moving. And I'd record a number called the NGDR, or net to gross displacement ratio. This number is a ratio between the net displacement the distance between the starting point and ending point of the track, divided by the gross displacement, which is how far the bacterium actually traveled to get between those two points. The net displacement, an, an NGDR of 1, would be produced if you have just a straight line, as in the top. It's because you're dividing one distance by the same distance, you're getting a ratio of 1. And on the bottom, you get 0 if it, the bacterium ended up exactly where it began, even no matter how curvy the line was. And with the middle image, there, this happens to be an NGDR of 3 fourths, because even though the distance between the two points is 3, the actual distance that the E. coli traveled was 4. And here's a video clip that I took of the E. coli. The top here represents the, uh, what you actually shows what you'd see if you looked down in the tube through the microscope. The black dots are E. coli that are in focus, and the white ones are E. coli that are out of focus. And the bottom here is basically a graph showing where the E. coli have been. It's the output of the tracking software, a visual output so you can see approximately what activity is being recorded. Now, my control that I had, it wasn't very interesting. It was just that there was very minimal activity throughout the tube. There, the only activity was very small at station one. The rest was just all zeros. And when I looked back at the end of the tube, at, at the end of the experiment, when I looked back to where the E. coli had begun, they were very inactive. They were just lying around on the bottom of the tube or drifting aimlessly.
And my theory to explain this is that they just used up all their nutrients and died off. My experimental runs, however, were much more interesting. The E. coli, I found, tended to move down the tube in groups instead of just diffusing. If you take a 3D graph of the E. coli's movement with this axis here, the x-axis being the time in minutes, the, this here being the position that, the, that it was taken at, and this here being the number of tracks that were seen, you can see a couple rows, a couple groups of E. coli moving down the tube. And it's much easier to see this if you look at it from directly above, the time along the bottom in minutes, the position along the vertical axis in millimeters from the start of the tube. And if you look at the data, you can see a couple lines of peaks moving down here. These are groups that are moving down the tube. As you can see, there are two groups. And the first group seems to be going a bit faster than the first, in, than the second. And my theory to explain the fact that there are groups moving down the tube is that in the beginning, there is a nice high food supply throughout the tube. I'm just guessing at the food supply. I didn't really have a way to measure it. And the E. coli all started where they had started in the uh, first 10 millimeters of the tube. And a gradient started to form between the high level of nutrients that were in the new fresh media in the tube and the slightly depressed level of nutrients that the E. coli had grown and been cultured in. And this gradient was detected by the E. coli, and they moved up it down the tube. And as they were moving up the gradient, they were depressing the nutrient supplies. They were eating, so they pushed the gradient back, and kept following this moving gradient down the tube all the way to the end. So they probably moved in groups because they were following a gradient. Now, in addition to moving in groups, these groups had a higher NGDR and a higher speed than the rest of the population of the E. coli. If you look at a graph of the NGDR, with time along the x-axis again, and position along the y-axis, and the median NGDR along the z-axis. And you look at it from above. And you take the lines from the number of tracks graph, and you put those on the NGDR graph. It is possible to see a line of peaks approximately corresponding with the lines on the graph. And you can see that they're peaks because their data is up high in the red spectrum of the scale whereas the rest is down in the yellow of the uh, scale, showing that the NGDR was higher. And if you look at a speed graph and look at it from above with the same axis set up, and you have the um, lines from the number of tracks graph, and you put those on the speed graph, it is still faintly possible to see a row of peaks going along those lines. And they're moving along. They have a higher NGDR and speed than the rest of the population, probably because they're following a much stronger gradient than the rest of the population, if the rest of the population is even following a gradient at all. And in addition to these, there was a third point. Each group was smaller than the one before it. If you look at a graph of the data for another different run, and you look at it from above, and put on the track lines, you can see that there's first a very pronounced group with numbers up around 4,500 or 3,500 in the red and yellow section of the scale. And another group down here, which seemed to be moving slower and was smaller because its numbers were down here on the scale. And if you look in the background, it is possible to see another two groups possibly forming back there, going, and they're still smaller, down in the lower section of the scale. And my theory to explain why the groups got smaller and slower is that the E. coli originally started back in the beginning of the tube with a high level of nutrients throughout and a low level where the E. coli had been. A gradient was forming between them. And 
only the first few E. coli detected this gradient, and they moved off down the tube following the gradient. And they left behind them a food supply which was lower than the rest of the E. coli had. So there was a for forward biased gradient here, driving all the E. coli back up into this section, keeping them away from the intermediate area in here. So the, they would all stay where they are, while the first group moves on down the tube in pursuit of its moving gradient. Now, while it's doing that, the E. coli back here are pushing the gradient, are pushing the, their nutrient supplies down, making the gradient shallower and shallower, until eventually they reverse the gradient. And now it's pointed forwards and attracts the next few E. coli off the front of the supply back here. But since it's not as strong a gradient, it's a smaller group following it, and they aren't moving quite as quickly, and their NGDR is lower. So there are two groups now moving down, and the process repeats. And so in conclusion, my hypothesis is wrong. Instead of the simple diffusion of the E. coli down the tube, there were, they actually moved in groups, which had a higher NGDR and speed than the rest of the population and were smaller than each group before them. And for further work, I'd like to be able to measure the nutrient levels. Right now, I'm only guessing at them. But if I could measure the nutrient levels, which I'm going to try to do, then I could verify my conclusions that I reached here. And I'd also like to vary the types of nutrients that I use, possibly to see what it is in the Lurea broth that the E. coli are most attracted to. And I'd also like to experiment with various repellents, see what will drive the E. coli away and what their patterns of movement will be for that, maybe a pH change or some toxin. And ultimately, I'd like to create a computer simulation of the E. coli to a mathematical model that could predict how the E. coli will move given some starting conditions. And here are my references. And I'd also especially like to thank Dr. John Waterbury and Dr. Scott Gallagher for all the help that I received on this project. Any questions? Well, the non-modal bacteria, there are strains of E. coli that do move and strains that don't. And the non-modal bacteria simply have nutrients they need right there with them. They don't move to get the nutrients, which is a slight disadvantage, but they do survive. Spore formation might be another possibility. Yeah, possibly. Allowing them to spread widely with spores, yeah. I wouldn't know. There might be, but I don't know if there are, are any. Hi, I'm Megan, and this is my project about ozone pollution in white pines. Um, I'm expanding this year on the topic that I did last year, but this year it's comparing the average needle length, tip necrosis length, and chlorotic model of white pine needles from trees in different locations to the relative ozone pollution of that area. Um, first of all, ozone pollution, it's O3. Um, it's present in the stratosphere, which is the second layer of our atmosphere. And it's vital for life on Earth because it um, absorbs ultraviolet radiation from the sun, specifically UVB rays. 
which are responsible for causing cancer, cataracts, wrinkles. Um, ozone pollution occurs, however, when ozone is present in the troposphere, which is the surface of our atmosphere that we live in on Earth. It's the troposphere. And um, this is called ozone pollution because it's extremely damaging to the tissue of living things. Um, it's formed when volatile organic compounds and nitrogen oxides react with sunlight. And um, it's the most widespread pollutant in Europe and North America. In humans, it causes a big problem because it aggravates and increases susceptibility to many different lung ailments, such as pneumonia, bronchitis, and um, it reduces lung function capacity for exercise. And eventually, over the long term, it can cause permanent lung damage, even if you're not exposed to high level of levels of ozone, but if you're exposed to relatively low levels over a period of time. Um, in plants, that's also turning out to be an issue, too, because it damages plant tissue, which can reduce crop yield, foliage, um, et cetera. And this is turning into a problem for crops for food in the South, especially because um, crop yields are being severely shortened. Um, white pine trees are the trees that I were looking at in relation to ozone pollution. White pines are very good environmental indicators. I'm sure as you drive down the highway, you can see the trees along the side of the road look very brown, and that's because they're being burned by the chemicals on the side of the road. So in order to look at ozone pollution, I was going to look at environmental indicators first because they're generally a good way to tell when the environment's being hurt that we haven't noticed in ourselves yet. Um, white pine needles come in bundles of five called fascicles. This is an outward view of a white pine fascicle. It's the five needles looking out. Um, there are triangular prisms, and the two inner sides are the stomata sides. And um, these are really prevalent on Cape Cod because they like the sandy soil so much. Um, when ozone enters into the stomatas of the white pine needle, it kills the mesophyll tissue, which is where the chlorophyll is, where photosynthesis takes place. And so you can see in the figure on the left, it causes a phenomenon called chlorotic model, and that's where the mesophyll tissue is being killed. Um, it produces this yellow spotting that tends to blend in with the greenness of the needle around the stomata. Um, figure three on the right is something that you have to be able to distinguish it from. This is chlorotic fleck. And it's caused by abiotic factors like salt flecking or chemical damage. And that's more of a brown region that looks like the needle's been burned. And once you look at enough pine needles, you can really tell the difference between the two. So that's one characteristic that ozone pollution presents itself in, in white pine trees. Um, the second characteristic is tip necrosis, which is basically tip, um, death of the tip of the needle. This is a white pine needle, and you can see the end of it. It's a really distinct cutoff where the end of the needle is um, basically burned to death. Once a needle is 40% covered with chlorotic model and tip necrosis, it's, its function is basically reduced to nothing, and it's not helping the tree at all. Um, so the ozone pollution is damaging the trees in these two ways. And the third characteristic I looked at was average needle length of the needle, which tends to decrease with the more ozone pollution. Um, so the purpose of this project was to compare the states of the white pine trees using these three variables from different locations to see if there was a correlation between the amount of damage to the tree and the tree's proximity to ozone-producing emitters. Um, it was hypothesized obviously that the white pine trees closer to these areas of increased pollution would show more damage. And I divided this up into three specific hypotheses for the Cape. First of all, the trees um, northeast of the Murant power plant in Sandwich, I thought they would show a lot more damage than the trees southwest because of the wind patterns and how that would be blowing the ozone up over the trees. Um, secondly, trees on the south side of the moraine would show more damage than trees on the north side. This is because the Cape sticks out into the Atlantic Ocean and basically all the pollution is being blown up and hits the south side of the Cape first. And finally, trees closest to main roads, intersections, et cetera, would show a lot more damage than trees in more rural settings. Um, the phenomenon that explains my first two hypotheses, this is called the tailpipe of the Midwest, and this is referred to a lot, especially in newspaper articles about the Cape. Um, when the volatile organic compounds and nitrogen oxides are admitted, they need to be in the presence of sunlight for a while before they react to form ozone. So you can see in this graph, the amount of ozone in the air actually peaks about 150 miles from the source of it. So even though Cape Cod seems like a very clean place out in the ocean, lots of fresh air, we're actually getting all the pollutants from the Midwest and the big industrial centers that blow right up the coastline and hit Cape Cod 
where the most of their ozone is being produced. Um, the EPA and the Clean Air Act in 1997 set standards for ozone pollution at 85 parts per billion for ambient ozone, and they measure that with different stations throughout the Northeast. But most of Massachusetts is in violation of the EPA standard, but no one's actually done anything about it yet. Uh, my methods, I found three white pine trees of relatively similar ages. White pine trees, their branches grow in layers, so if you count the layers, that's the number of years old they are. Um, so I found three trees in each of 11 areas around Cape Cod, and I found them from everywhere from the Falmouth Academy parking lot up to Barnstable and Sandwich. These are the locations on the Cape. The yellow dot is the Muron Power Plant in Sandwich, and the red dots are where I collect the needles from. Um, ten needles were selected from each of the three trees for each location, and I measured the total length, the tip necrosis, and then I stuck each needle under a microscope and put clear transparency over it, and I would count the number of squares the needle took up and then the number of squares that the chlorotic model took up to get a percent of the needle covered in chlorotic model. So each of these three variables was, was averaged for the trees in each location. Um, I'm going to show you three charts, and it compares each um, variable separately to the different locations. This one is the average needle length for each location, and I arranged it in order of increasing needle length. So the healthiest needle should be on the right, and the least healthy should be on the left. You can see on the left there is the busy intersection Mashby, the northeast of the power plant, and the Christmas tree parking lot in Hyannis. This is the most um, variable and, I guess, insignificant characteristic of the three because needle length is such a variable statistic, and it depends a lot on tree age, where it is, the amount of sunlight. And also there's a range of healthy values for trees to have, so um, the exact order doesn't matter so much as long as they have a healthy value. This is the second chart. It's the tip necrosis, or death of the tip of the needle. So the more tip necrosis, the more unhealthy the tree. And you can see the locations fit really well with the hypothesis that on the right hand you have the neighborhood northeast of the power plant, parking lots, parking lots and intersection on the left. There's conservation land and woods. Um, you can see the R va values, the um, lines that go up and down on the bars are really high. This indicates variability in data, which usually makes it less conclusive. But the nature of the data collected, tip necrosis, is that it doesn't occur equally to all needles in the fascicle. That's not how it happens in nature. But the part that's relevant is the proliferation and the amount of tip necrosis. So the average is more useful to statistic than the um, R squared values. This is the third characteristic, chlorotic model. And once again, the more chlorotic model, the less healthy the needle. And this fits really well with the hypothesis, again, because you can see the neighborhoods northeast of the power plant parking lots had really high levels of um, chlorotic model. These needles are not functioning anymore. The trees are basically dead. They have almost half of the needle is covered in chlorotic model. And then on the left, you can see the healthier trees, the Woods and West Barnstable conservation land. And all of the trees on the Cape were actually damaged to some extent because of the pollution we have. But you can see there are big discrepancies between the different needles. This is just a table of the averages for each location. Um, so first of all, analysis, the first hypothesis about the trees northeast of the power plant versus southwest, this um, was fully supported because the trees found northeast of the power plant were basically dead. They weren't functioning anymore. Um, here are some examples. The residential area southwest had 0.9 millimeters tip necrosis, 9% chlorotic model, while northeast of the power plant an average length of 72 millimeters, 46 millimeters tip necrosis, and you can see the high amounts of damage northeast. Um, these are two pictures of trees northeast of the power plant. You can see the one on the left, you the smokestacks are visible, and these trees are basically dead as of right now. The second hypothesis about the trees on the north side of the marine versus the south side of the marine did not, um, was not supported. The trees were more um, affected by their direct proximity to the ozone emitters than to the relative wind patterns. An example, the trees in Phoebe Woods in the south side of the Cape were far healthier than those in Sandwich, which is on the north side. Um, the third hypothesis was fully supported that trees near busy intersections, urban places, were a lot more damaged than trees in rural locations. For example, the woods in West Barnstable had an average in the length of 90 millimeters almost no tip necrosis, 3% chlorotic model. However, at the 
intersection in Mashby. It was a very short needle line hypnoprosis and a lot of chlorotic model. And then these are two more examples that support the same conclusion, that the woods and the conservation land have healthy values while the Thomas Academy parking lot and shopping plaza have severely damaged needles. Um, sources of error in this project, this during a drought, somatas of the pineals can close and so ozone is actually not reaching the mesophyll tissue. That wasn't really an issue here. But uh, an issue that you always have to take into consideration in projects looking at nature is that there's so much variation that occurs naturally, I abiotic factors like salt, especially in the key, and the variation in amount of proper nutrients, et cetera. But um, this project tried to control for all the variables it could by finding relative ages, et cetera. Um, areas of, of improvement and future research. Uh, there's actually a thing called an ozonometer that can read the exact parts per billion of ambient ozone in the air, which the EPA uses at various monitoring stations around New England that I looked at last year. Um, I could use a larger sampling group of trees, but the problem is with the project I did this year, it was already around 1,400 measurements, and so that was tedious enough. And I could also contact scientists. There are a lot of people in the Western U.S. that are working with Jeffrey and Ponderosa pines, which have slightly different characteristics than white pines, so I couldn't really correlate their information. And they're also doing research on it in the South for crops and stuff, but it's kind of ironic. The research they're doing is on the yield of tobacco plants. So who cares? Um, every year, huge amounts of volatile organic compounds and nitrogen oxides are being pumped into the atmosphere. And these are severely harming the health of humans, even though we may not realize it because it's not immediate effects that we can tie in. Um, the more we learn about how the ozone is affecting the plants on the earth, we can start realizing how it's going to start affecting us. Um, these are uh, articles from the Cape Cod Times, which are really pertinent to our own health. This is a picture of a Muron power plant. Um, the officials who are going bankrupt right now are trying to delay complying with emission standards for another two years, and just the delay in complying with emission standards will result in almost 16 million more pounds of nitrogen oxides. And studies from Harvard and Muron actually will link this to 87 premature deaths, 940 emergency room visits. You can see on the left all the statistics. And this is just from a delay in complying with standards, not what they're already um, letting out. And you can see on the right how the air in the Cape is actually much more unhealthy than the air in Boston. And this is about how all of the national seashores are flunking the EPA's health standards. And that's continuation in the article. And this was actually in Saturday in the Cape um, Cod Times. And it says in the top, you can see Barnesville County has failed every air quality report since the ALA began issuing them in 2000. And this was taking into account ozone. And so I'd like to thank Dr. Johnson, my family, and my three teachers at FA that helped me. No, I'll be senior next year, so don't we don't do science fair. How about in college? Possibly, yeah. I like to continue working with 